Welcome everyone to the Cascade AUVSI Chapters panel session on urban air mobility. Cascade AUVSI is part of the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. Cascade Chapter represents Oregon and Washington. We are proud to present this is part of a series of events that we're doing to help connect the industry and educate, provide some informative insights into some of the things that are happening. I think urban air mobility is really an important part of technologies that are being developed by this industry. With that, I'll, I'll introduce Lori Brown. She's our executive director and uh, she'll hand off to Lori. You're going to find we're really just not here yet, but we're on our way. And I'm going to introduce our moderator today, Bruce Agnew. He's the director of Cascadia Center in Seattle and co-chair of Pacific Northwest Economic Region and also the, in the transportation group. And then he's director of ACES Northwest Network. So Bruce, I'll hand it over to you and you can introduce the rest of the panel members. Great, thank you, uh, Laurie, and I appreciate um, AUVSI. It's a wonderful group, and it's, this is gonna be a great session. Uh, on your screen, you can see uh, the list of our panelists and their affiliations. Uh, you're gonna hear a mix today of technical experts uh, on the remarkable advances in technology for urban air mobility. And then we're also going to hear from panelists about uh, uh, the opportunity to kind of bring us back to earth and explore the land use, social equity, transit, and rideshare connections from vertiports ports to surface transportation mobility centers. Um, as Lori mentioned, I am the director of the Cascadia Center of Discovery Institute, and we staff the ACES Northwest Network. ACES stands for Autonomous Connected Electric and Shared Mobility for people and freight. Scott Kuznicki, uh, one of our panelists today, is our technical advisor. ACES is co-chaired by Tom Alberg from Madrona Venture Group. Tom was an original investor in Amazon way back in 1995 and served on the board for 22 years, recently retiring. Um, Madrona is a venture capital firm and has started many of the successful startups here in the Northwest. Our other co-chair is Brian Mistily, who came from Ford and then headed up the Microsoft automotive section. Um, Brian is a CEO and co-founder of Inrex, which is a traffic data and global navigation company based in Kirkland. You probably have seen Inrex's name in the paper. They rank traffic congestion in, in US cities and they're quoted widely in, in, in the global press. Um, one of the things that we hope to accomplish today is uh, to set up a foundation between the, the technical people in UAM, as we call it, and the folks that are dealing with land use and local government and state legislators. Um, and we believe that the Cascadia Corridor, which roughly parallels I-5 from Oregon's Willamette Valley to um, Vancouver, BC, and then reaching across the water to Victoria, uh, is a unique area with highway, rail, utility corridors, and waterways, both rivers and uh, what we call the Salish Sea. And it, in our mind, represents a prime deployment opportunity because it combines urban metro areas, Vancouver, Seattle, Tacoma, Everett, and Portland, Vancouver, Washington, with rural areas. So the, the deployment opportunities for uh, urban air mobility are remarkable. And uh, we hope that this session will be the beginning of a long-term partnership. As you will see, we have uh, speakers from Oregon, from Washington. We have a few folks from British Columbia. There's in fact an active chapter for UAM in, in Vancouver. And we hope at the uh, Pacific Northwest Conference that we hope to have in Victoria in November to have a session with our Canadian counterparts, uh, counterparts on UAM. And so we look forward to that. Finally, um, people have asked me, well, what is urban air mobility? So I'm gonna read the common definition of it. A safe, efficient, accessible, quiet, and multi-use air transportation system for passenger mobility, cargo delivery, and emergency management within and traversing a metropolitan area. 
UAM can include both onboard ground piloted and autonomous operations. UAM can include a combination of commercial and non-commercial operations, such as business to consumer service, a fractional and shared ownership model, peer-to-peer -peer service, and personally owned aircraft. Now, rural air mobility is evolving on a different track, but has a similar definition. So our, our first panelist will be Rick Stevens from the Portland area, and I'll turn it over to Rick now. It's a pleasure to be with you today in virtual reality and introduce some urban air mobility aircraft. There are many definitions of UAM and the one that Bruce gave is a great one. And as he noted, it's important to note that in addition to urban air mobility, there is a corresponding regional air mobility with differing objectives and programs. There are six general types of UAM aircraft. We will start with traditional helicopters and end with more unique hover bikes and conceptual flying cars. Robinson 44s and 66s are flown by Oregon helicopters. Their helicopter taxi service connects the downtown Portland heliport with Portland International Airport and multiple sites throughout the region. Uber and Blade have helicopter taxi services connecting Manhattan with JFK International Airport in New York. They fly a variety of aircraft, including these Bell 427 and 429 helicopters for this inner city shuttle service. The Oregon Helicopters, Blade, and Uber programs provide models for on-demand mobility and are being replicated in Dallas and Los Angeles. Lockheed Martin is collaborating with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, on their Sikorsky Autonomy Research Aircraft in Stratford, Connecticut. The aircraft labor and cockpit automation system is a tailorable drop-in removable kit that can convert any helicopter or airplane into a remotely piloted aircraft. The Ehung autonomous aerial vehicles are manufactured in Guangzhou, China, and have recently entered internet into an agreement to provide air taxi service for the LN Hotel. The Ehung 216 has 16 motors, a hexadecacopter. They are conducting test flights in North America and the United Arab Emirates and are designing e-port vertiport designs for international development. And we will hear more about this later. The Volocopter and Volocity electric air taxis are based in Bruxelles, Germany. The 18 motor off the decacopter electric air taxi conducted this demonstration flight at Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart last year. Like Ehong, Volocopter is developing Voloports or Skyports for their air taxi service in other countries, beginning with Singapore. Wiscora is an electric self-flying air taxi from Mountain View, California. The aircraft has 12 lift rotors and one tail pusher propeller. WISC recently partnered with the government of New Zealand to conduct passenger transport trials. And this video is showing test flights for both conventional takeoff and vertical landing. To date, Cora has conducted over 1,000 flights. Boeing is very active in urban air mobility and the POV Personal Air Vehicle is one of their hybrid lift and cruise designs. The Manassas, Virginia project has eight lift rotors and one tail pusher propeller. The PAV is an optionally piloted vehicle or OPV, which may have an onboard pilot or be remotely piloted. The Czech Zuri has a similar configuration and is depicted here after encountering Amazonian natives. The San Jose, California-based A-Cube Vahana recently completed its flight trials at the Pendleton Unmanned Aircraft Systems Range in Oregon. This electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft has eight rotors on tilt wings. The research from this project will be applied to further development of autonomous systems for Airbus UAM aircraft. Lilium Jet is based in Vestling, Germany, where they are developing the world's first five-seater all-electric vertical takeoff and landing jet. The aircraft has 36 all-electric ducted fans and is shown in this video undergoing test maneuvers near their headquarters at a special facility adjacent the Munich International Airport.
Colin Fours is a plumber in Stamford, England, who built a two-rotor dicopter hover bike in his garage. The two-stroke combustion engines are piloted by weight shifting and two throttles. There are, as you can see in this video, no other controls. Hoversurf is developing a series of hover bikes in Moscow, Russia. The four-rotor quadcopter here was adapted for training by the Dubai Police Department in 2017. And the video here is from the same year at the Moscow Raceway. As a side note, the Russian weapon manufacturer Kalashnikov has also built a flying motorcycle. Terrafugia originated in Woburn, Massachusetts and announced the TFX as the world's first practical flying car in 2009. It is a two-rotor tilt propeller inducted fan propulsion EV tall aircraft and a self-driving car. Terrafugia was recently acquired by the automobile manufacturer Zhejiang Geely, which owns Volvo and Lotus. In addition to the TFX, Geely is developing several other UAM aircraft. And for our last example, the pop-up next concept vehicle is part of the Airbus Audi ITEL design program to develop seamless, multimodal, fully electric urban mobility. The four-rotor tilt propeller autonomous passenger drone is also a self-driving car. Thank you for your time. Our next panelist is Scott Kuznicki, President at Modern Traffic. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Rick, and thank you for your presentation. Today, I've been asked to speak to you about advanced air mobility, uh, particularly in the context of urban air mobility, and to describe what the passenger transportation customer experience looks like. And to provide you with those insights, I'm very excited to uh, share some photographs from the ITS World Congress in Singapore. And uh, Singapore is Quite the amazing place. Um, here's a view from the sky. So let's talk. We'll talk about the view from the sky park in a moment. But before I get to that, I would like to acknowledge um, the Transportation Futures Research Fellowship from the Cascadia Center for Regional Development. Uh, that's what's uh, funding the research that I'm conducting uh, into emerging mobility. Let's take a look at uh, Singapore, which I mentioned. Uh, this is a view from the sky park at the Marina Bay Sands Hotel. Off to the left there, you can see the Fullerton Hotel, the Esplanade Bridge, and off to the right, we have the Esplanade Theaters. Uh, taking a daytime shot, we're still looking across Marina Bay. You can see the theaters in the background. In the immediate foreground is the Art Science Museum. But off to the right, I'd like to call your attention um, to uh, this one particular place here, which is, um, you can see the soccer field there and the grandstand. Um, and if you see close enough there, you can see that there is a vertiport. And so let's get a little closer to that vertiport. We'll come down from the roof of the Marina Bay Sands Hotel and stand in the grandstands. This particular vertiport happens to be built by Skyports, and it's the Volo port for the Volo Copter. This demonstration was provided for attendees at the ITS World Congress in Singapore last October. And a number of us were fortunate enough to be able to take a tour of the Volo port, and I'm thrilled today to take you inside. Let's go down and uh, stand next to the Volo port. This building was built, if you can believe it, in less than five days. Uh, they said it was actually quite crazy to work out all the logistics that it takes to erect a building like this. Thankfully, it was air conditioned as we happen to be at one degrees north latitude. Uh, but it really represents ultimately the final concept for Volo port, um, which they've developed, which is an open concept, a very inviting concept and passenger transportation today needs to be all about the customer experience what conveniences and what safety can you provide to your customers so as you can see you can see straight through the volo port uh, in fact you get a glimpse of what's inside well what's inside is this uh, this is the volocopter x2 and i'd like to point out as rick mentioned that it does have 18 individual motors and 18 individual blades um, the technology that's being used in this emerging and new uh, advanced air mobility is actually quite stunning because it's taking it to the next level. So if you think about a conventional helicopter, you have one engine, 
uh, one large blade. That large blade happens to produce a lot of low frequency vibrations. Uh, we generally, we can hear helicopters coming from a long distance away. What you have here is 18 very small blades, no internal combustion engine, okay? So what you, the experience for you as a customer and the experience for you as a neighbor of one of these facilities is decidedly different from that of people who live next to heliports uh, because it is extremely quiet. It's also very safe. Uh, this particular piece of equipment has triple redundancy in the control systems and nine separate power supplies. Uh, so imagine, um, you know, in an airplane, you have one point of failure, essentially, if the engine quits, the plane turns into a glider, hopefully you can find a spot to land, uh, because from that point on, you will pretty much continuously lose altitude. Um, in one of these uh, urban air mobility um, transport devices, you don't have to worry about that, because you have 18 separate motors, apparently half of them can fail, uh, and this particular aircraft will continue to stay aloft. And you also have the redundancy in the control systems and the redundancy in the power systems. So here's uh, design specifications. You can find these uh, relatively quickly online. What's important to note is that the payload of one of these aircraft is approximately 350 pounds and has a 17 mile range, which is suitable for most uh, urban operations. Um, and particularly uh, if the point to point transport distance is um, 10 to 12 miles and there are batteries on site, at the destination, it's pretty easy to change those out. And you can see that its rate of climb is three meters per second, which translates to approximately 1,100 feet per second, which is comparable to most single engine small aircraft. Uh, I'm not representing Volocopter Skyports. Uh, I have no financial interest in those organizations, but since I was at their demonstration, I'm prepared to share with you uh, what they shared and also some of the, um, some of the things that have evolved since then. Um, they aren't the only people in this industry. In fact, we'll see some others here in my presentation today, but Volocopter to date has secured 122 million euro in uh, venture capital funding to continue to expand their operations. And that is a significant amount. And one of the things that we see in this industry is that uh, venture capital is driving it forward. Um, and it's not necessarily all about just creating uh, this advanced air mobility. It's actually about creating an entire ecosystem um, that provides for things like sustainable power. Skyports has um, developed a lot of partnerships, as particularly with public and private transit operators, which means that they are working on this piece of truly integrating the transportation system. So the air transport brings you to one point, and it's easy to access the ground transport. Uh, we've already discussed some of the safety features of this aircraft, and there are others that we can talk about later on in the chat. But most importantly, I think, is the revolutionary approach to the customer experience. And so if we go back and stand in front of the Volaport, why don't we walk inside and see what you get to do. First, as a customer, you get to check in. Uh, and this is now post-coronavirus world. Um, many people probably wonder if they want to touch a kiosk. That's been shared by hundreds of other people during the day. Um, but in this pre-coronavirus world, they actually thought this through quite well. Um, if you stand on that green circle, you're able to check in, um, provide information. Um, you can see that there's a camera there, so they have a way of authenticating you as a passenger, but more importantly, they're actually weighing you surreptitiously. And that is extremely important because as we mentioned, the aircraft has a limited payload. And so weighing the passenger without asking them their weight is uh, one of the key facets of this experience. It's something that makes it seamless. It doesn't make a person uncomfortable, for example. If we turn around and face inward, we can see that uh, there is our 2X um, and behind it out through those glass doors is the landing pad. Uh, you can see that the 2X here carries two passengers. And again, it's an open design. There's lots of natural light. It's very transparent to uh, the passenger what exactly is going to happen. They walk in, they check in, uh, then they have an opportunity to see the aircraft to actually um, view it kind of uh, in this almost like a showroom environment, and they can clearly see where they're going next. If we take a walk around the room and look outside, um, we see, uh, which is quite attractive, bowl of, port. of course, you have to have a windsock, and that's downtown Singapore in the background across Marina Bay. Going back inside and turning around, I want to call your attention to um, the thought that has been given to um, how easy it is now with electric vehicles um, to deal with maintenance and fuel 
uh, instead of having an outdoor fueling station and uh, capture for spilled fuel and all of these other things, we simply have a charging room. Uh, we could use solar panels on the roof of one of these vertiports to provide the charge for the electric batteries for these electric aircraft. Uh, if we take a look inside the charging room, these are actually approximately the size of um, the battery modules that would be used in the airplane. I do like the quote on the wall. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, of course, contributed a lot to the science of flight. Um, and this isn't the only model. Uh, we can see in Paris that Uber uh, has been working with um, some of my collaborators at Gannett Fleming to think about what a uh, verdict port would look like on top of a transit facility, for example, where uh, perhaps a train station. So um, stunning design ideas, um, but we're all heading towards sustainability. And I think that's the important thing to take away here in the Pacific Northwest next week, actually, a company called Maginex will be um, conducting a test flight of an electrically operated, uh, electrically fueled Cessna caravan. It's very exciting. That'll be taking place in Moses Lake. But if we look towards the future, what I think we're seeing is a, a more sustainable world where we have electric mobility, even if it is air mobility, even if it is extremely safe, uh, we can still accomplish this, which is to essentially um, keep the world uh, safe for all of us. Uh, and what I want to point out about Singapore is that um, if you look at those trees, they actually are biomass. Um, underneath is a biomass burner. And those are the outlets for all of the recycled biomass on the island, approximately 80 tons a day. All of that is converted into electricity. Um, it is essentially no mining, um, no coal, no natural gas, but biomass. And uh, inside one of those domes you have this waterfall um, I'm sure someone would like to fly a drone inside one of these domes, but very soon um, these electric aircraft will be taking to the sky in Singapore. This is one of the places where that will happen. Uh, so I'd also like to give a quick shout out to AUVSI and the TRB and AUVSI Automated Vehicle Symposium that will be taking place in July. As far as I understand it, it's still on in San Diego. At the end of July, I'll be presenting on road assessment systems for self-driving transport and I invite you to continue the conversation. Thank you for your time. And at this point, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker who is Spencer Monheim uh, with NASA. Uh, Spencer. I'm uh, Spencer Monheim, as uh, Scott just graciously introduced me. Um, I'm the uh, technical lead for the national campaign. It's a project for our uh, advanced air mobility project. And I work as the tech lead for the simulation side. And so one of the things I kind of want to talk about is what NASA is doing in this uh, kind of space of urban air mobility, since one of the kind of key vectors that we're looking into is really trying to see what the, not only timeline is, but what are the kind of technical problems we need to tackle before we can move forward with urban air mobility. And so we kind of separated it into these kind of five pillars as we call them or objectives for how to uh, lead towards urban air mobility. And so the kind of objectives of this national campaign are to accelerate the certification and approval of vehicles, develop the flight procedure guidelines, evaluate what the CNS trade space is, try and demonstrate what airspace operations management will look like architecture and also uh, using it wise, like what the actual methodology and mechanisms are for using this airspace operation management is, and then additionally vehicle noise. And so we've kind of broken up each of these objectives into having uh, problems that we want to tackle, which we have as vehicle barriers, airspace barriers, community barriers, and then really building this UAM proving ground to host and uh, allow us to test these different objectives and try and learn a little bit more. And so overall, the kind of goal is to really promote public confidence in urban air mobility and have people feel confident that not only that these vehicles are safe, but that the systems that allow them to operate are safe. Try and give a way for these vehicle manufacturer, manufacturers and operators, as well as potential uh, private entities that want to provide a service, things like scheduling or weather and try and give these different manufacturers and uh, providers insights into how the both regulatory and operational environment is going to evolve. And then lastly, the other goal is to really try and facilitate a community-wide learning and uh, experience, test, 
while also trying to capture what the public's you know imagination of what this transformative uh, form of transportation is going to look like. And so it's really a culmination of both the manufacturers, the operators, and the service providers to figure out how this uh, system is going to come together and, and really work, especially in the current airspace that, uh, system that we have today. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Yolanka Wolf to introduce herself. Good afternoon, and thank you to AVSI Cascade Chapter for organizing this uh, this webinar. I'm really excited to be talking to you. Um, I am the co-executive director of CAMI, the Community Air Mobility Initiative, and I will tell you a little bit more about CAMI in a few minutes, but I'm going to get started uh, uh, with uh, uh, my slides first and talk a little bit about what is urban air mobility. Um, we've heard, we heard Bruce's definition and that it, uh, Bruce's definition is a, um, is, is the general definition that's being used today. Um, I think one of the, but there's, there's some confusion. Um, NASA has recently come out with the term advanced air mobility. A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, the Air Force do their big agility prime rollout and they're talking about flying orbs. So um, rather than create a new term, um, I just want to explain a little bit about CAMI's role within this industry and where we, where we work. So at CAMI, we use a broad definition. It's similar to NASA's AAM terminology with respect to commercial operations. So we're looking not just at operations within city centers, but also connecting those urban economic centers to the suburbs and surrounding edge cities and to rural areas. We're also not just looking at on-demand air taxi operations. For us, urban air mobility includes scheduled service, bus route style service, hub airport shuttles, and most importantly for early adoption, emergency services. This is the view of aviation most people are familiar with today. There is a strict boundary between your daily life and your flight. While we have to maintain security and safety in urban air mobility operations, to be successful, we have to at least figuratively tear down the fence. Urban air mobility needs to be intimately integrated with existing transportation systems, including highways and transit options. And we need to do that integration in a way that doesn't create a whole host of new problems. Doing that integration correctly is really a local question. To date, most of the industry level regulatory and policy discussions have been happening at the federal level. We need to be working towards a constructive and consistent local regulatory landscape as well. So we founded CAMI to support state and local decision makers and other stakeholders so they can make decisions that work for their communities while still having some uniformity as to how urban air mobility is approached more broadly. Who are these stakeholders? At CAMI, we like to refer to them as the cast of characters, with many of them shown here. As you can see, they range from industry members, such as manufacturers, operators, and airports, uh, regulators at the federal, state, and local levels, agencies such as transportation and commerce, business owners, real estate developers, insurance companies, essential services, and of course, the public. So one of the challenges that comes up over and over again, and it was actually the impetus to form CAMI, is that to, with technology moving forward quickly and work being done on the regulatory side, at least at the federal level, uh, the industry, uh, the, push the push is there from the industry to create this, uh, this new form of transportation. What we don't have, however, is the demand pull on the other side. And over and over again, um, at conferences from Uber Elevate to uh, other national and international platforms, we keep hearing that the biggest challenge 
is going to be public acceptance. It's, it, and this comes from helping the public understand what urban air mobility is and why they might want it. As we've seen with drones, helicopters, airports, and even 5G wireless technology, the general public isn't always in favor of new technology. We must provide the necessary information that communities need to make an informed decision about this new form of transportation and to ensure that urban air mobility is actually providing tangible value to as many people as possible within a community. To address these facets of public acceptance requires full and transparent engagement between the UAM industry, regulators, and community members. CAMI was created to broaden the conversation and support local decision makers with UAM integration. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We educate and equip state and local decision makers, the public, and the media with the information they need to set policies and design infrastructure and systems that address transportation needs for their communities. CAMI also brings the concerns of these communities back to the UAM industry to help the industry chart the right course for success. CAMI was founded last fall and while we are relatively new, uh, my co-executive director Anna Dietrich and I had been uh, involved in the electric aircraft industry for over 10 years apiece. In fact, uh, one of the vehicles that Rick showed you, the uh, Terrafugia uh, rotable aircraft, uh, uh, Anna was one of the co-founders uh, of that company, of Terrafugia. Um, we are particular, uh, but we're grateful to the companies you see here, the forward-looking companies and organizations that provided early financial support last fall when we stood up CAMI. We're particularly proud that our supporters represent a broad spectrum of stakeholders, OEMs, large and small, first-tier uh, suppliers, other organizations and associations, governments, departments of transportation, and airports. If you're a company or organization in the UAM space that is passionate about supporting local communities, please reach out to us. On our website, you'll find a growing set of resources, including the videos from our first UAM 101 virtual event a couple of months ago. Uh, there you'll find uh, over three hours of presentations from eight uh, experts in, um, in various, on various topics of urban air mobility. Uh, in addition to Anna and I, we you will see on our website that we have a team of expert contributors who uh, for international experts in varying fields such as law, infrastructure, operations, vehicles, etc. More resources are being added to uh, our website regularly, and we're working to build out our future event schedule as well. So check back with our, uh, to our website often. CAMI's available to meet with state and local decision makers, airports, transportation departments, and other stakeholders to do presentations, develop and implement community engagement plans, or work with you to address the specifics of your community. There are four critical factors that must be addressed to achieve public acceptance of urban air mobility as a transportation option. Safety, public benefits, limiting adverse impacts, and transportation integration. We're gonna start by talking about safety. Safety is critical and non-negotiable. Commercial aviation has a strong safety record. However, urban air mobility will scale to a level more akin to automobiles. It isn't a simple question to determine what is safe enough. While it's primarily up to regulators like the FAA to answer that question, we also have to consider the public perception of safety. This comes from trust and includes not just the safety record, but also the feel of the aircraft, the feel of the ride, how coverage of and response to first accidents are handled. Instilling the belief that urban air mobility is safe in the mind of the public is key to public acceptance. 
Moving to public benefits. It's essential to public acceptance that we're able to demonstrate public benefits early on. One of the first questions we often get is whether urban air vehicles are just limos for the very rich. The answer is no. Urban air mobility uses the third dimension to pro provide commercial, economically viable transportation for the public. These benefits include increased mobility options, socioeconomic benefits, workforce development, and of course, emergency services. Urban air mobility has the potential to bring broad availability at a reasonable price to the public and a new mode of travel to metropolitan transportation systems. All of these benefits are in effect mitigating factors against the inevitable negative impacts that UAM will bring. Public acceptance requires us to limit adverse impacts of urban air mobility. This begins with transparency about these impacts, which include noise, visual pollution, emissions, battery life cycle challenges, impact on electricity capacity, and impact on existing modes of public transportation. Noise is one of these adverse impacts, though it's the one that often comes up and the one that industry uh, tends to focus on. Um, it's very, very understandable when you have a bunch of engineers in the room and they talk about public acceptance, their first instinct is, well, we, let's make it quieter. Um, but noise is not the only adverse impact. There are many communities who currently experience negative impacts from aircraft noise, often because they're located near large airports. But think about how you feel when you see and hear a medical helicopter overhead. Our awareness and appreciation for the benefit that such an aircraft provides obviates our irritation at the noise it might make. While manufacturers are working on reducing the decibel level for EV toll aircraft, doing only that oversimplifies the problem. Perceived annoyance of noise is also dependent on ambient noise levels, times and places of operation, and again, the counterbalancing value that urban air mobility brings. Non-acoustic factors such as these must be part of the public acceptance equation. And you can make a similar comparison with the other factors, uh, other adverse impacts such as visual pollution or grid, uh, effect on grid capacity. To enable the maximum benefit from urban air mobility, it needs to be integrated with the existing transportation landscape within a community. A good integration approach isn't just about where you think you'll have the most on-demand air taxi riders. Vertiports need to be co-located with other transportation hubs, such, such as we saw with the Volaport uh, uh, example, um, and a, a transportation hub such as light rail stations. For example, you can't locate a vertiport on top of a building if the street below that building is a through bus route with no curbside capacity for drop off and pick up of passengers. UAM has to take accessibility and social equity considerations into account. Urban air mobility also needs to integrate in a constructive way with existing transit. For example, we don't want to funnel more people into an already overtaxed subway system but we may want to use urban air mobility to increase ridership on an underutilized light rail system. Understanding transportation integration involves modeling and simulation. CAMI is working with NASA on their project to, to develop an open source software tool that planners and decision makers can use to model the addition of urban air mobility onto their transportation system. So where are we when it comes to public acceptance? Well, there are two big questions. The first is, is the UAM industry prepared for a completely different kind of aviation? Urban air mobility involves the intimate integration of the third dimension into our metropolitan transportation systems. 
Taking urban air mobility will be one option or mode in a multimodal transportation system that must function as a whole and must serve the community. This is aviation that is very different from the way the aviation industry has understood it before. Remember that first slide with the fence. Uh, um, so there's, there's a big shift that needs to happen from the industry itself. On the other side are cities and metropolitan regions prepared for this new form of transportation. Look at the two photographs on this slide. They were taken on Easter morning in New York City. The one on the left from 1900 shows one car in a sea of horse-drawn carriages. 13 years later, there is one horse in a sea of cars. Urban air mobility technology is moving forward rapidly. But modern transportation planning has a 10 to 20 year window. Are metropolitan planning organizations incorporating the third dimension into their plans? What about airports? Are utilities aware of the electric grid capacity needs that this form of transportation will require? Are departments of commerce thinking about the effects on workforce development? While we're still years away from a fully built out urban air mobility system, we are also years out when it comes to planning for this system. At CAMI, our mission is to provide the needed resources and services to resolve these questions at the state and local level. On behalf of CAMI, thank you for listening. Please visit our website or email us. And we look forward to connecting with you. Well, we promised you an interesting session uh, dealing with the incredibly advancing technologies and the different varieties. And then we brought you back to Earth to talk about how you connect from the surface to these exciting new uh, opportunities. Um, I've gotten several questions. I would remind everybody to type the questions in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, I, I'm going to start out with a question for Spencer. and we're, uh, honored to have NASA as a part of our panel today. Um, Spencer, the question is, what is the idea for having the market support not just operators or bodies such as the Federal Aviation Administration, but also companies who want to offer services for these entities, such as weather and scheduling and other things? Yeah, so one of the kind of key aspects that we're looking at in uh, our national campaign project is that it's not just about the vehicle providers. It's also about, again, the operators, but even more so there's going to be a real transformative industry that is going to pop up to really support what these uh, entities want to do operations wise. And so we're kind of approaching it from the perspective of what we're calling a supplemental data service provider which even though that's a mouthful, what that really means is I'm a company who wants to provide a service to one of these operators or vehicle manufacturers. And so something like scheduling to help a operator figure out what's the most optimal way to do their routes uh, for the number of vehicle on, vehicles on that route. What's the maximum throughput they can get while still maintaining that separation. Another example would be something like weather, where let's say a company wants to put together a mesh network of different weather instruments. A company could then go to these different operators and say, I have a service that provides real-time weather data, and I would like to be able to provide this to you at a you know, cost. And so we really see these uh, supplemental data service providers as a key part of this industry that's going to pop up and really provide services that a company may not necessarily want to develop themselves, or if the industry ends up moving towards standards where a company can provide a standardized type of service for multiple companies. And so we're, we're really curious and interested in seeing what the industry brings to, to this idea. And part of our work in the national campaign is actually doing some preliminary steps with some of these companies to see what they're going to bring to that industry. Great, thank you, Spencer. Uh, I've had two questions that are roughly along the same line, so I'm gonna blend them. Uh, and this is for anybody on the panel. Uh, what, let's see, from David, the vehicles shown carry few passengers. 
My take is that they will have limited effect on a very large number of passengers which pass through airports every day, except now. Can anyone address this? And then the second question along these lines is, is there any expectation that urban air mobility would carry even 1% of the traffic currently in cars or subway transportation? It seems like the skies could get very crowded very quickly if the UAM goals are met long before it significantly reduces demands on other transportation. Um, I think that uh, question reflected uh, maybe a pre-COVID environment in our in terms of the traffic on our highways now. Uh, Chris, so you want to start and then other panel members weigh in on that? Sure. Yeah, so one, one of the kind of ways that we're looking at the not only traffic demand, but what the traffic supply is going to be kind of tweet or looked at as is that we understand that a lot of people's perspectives at the current day is this is probably going to be too expensive for me to utilize. And so we always hear the idea of, you know, the rich man's taxi. And one of the things that we're looking at not just as NASA, but I think is really an industry, is how do we reduce the cost per mile? But additionally, how are we going to target these vehicles destination-wise such that it's not just necessarily for an airport? And so by looking at some vehicles that have smaller uh, passenger load, that'll be used for generally things kind of similar to what you would use in a ride-sharing mechanism, Let's say you're living across, uh, for my case, the Bay. So I live in the East Bay in uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco. If I want to go into the city, though, that might be something that I would use uh, an urban air mobility vehicle for. While something like a rural area, it might be used to take you to a rural regional airport. And so depending on the uh, problem that you're trying to solve, it's going to have a different type of vehicle for that and with the goal being to really lower the cost per mile such that it's attainable for people and then kind of skewing what uh, purposes people use them for whether it's a special occasion or standardized transport for people. Great. Scott, you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, thanks Bruce. What a great question uh, from our audience. Uh, what we're seeing in transportation right now is that um, some of the traffic congestion particularly in the afternoon is already returning. And what traffic congestion does is it essentially does two things. Unfortunately, it creates more carbon emissions. If we could expand our freeway system, we would see a reduction in carbon emissions, and we would also see a reduction in diversionary traffic that harms neighborhoods and communities. And the other thing that happens is that it saps economic activity. And so one of the things that urban air mobility provides is it provides people uh, with an on-demand service that can allow them to get from point to point very quickly when the need arises. And during other times, they may choose to use public transit. Uh, so, for example, in Singapore has an excellent rail transit system. It's also one of the most densely developed places in the world. And people do choose to use public transit there because it's safe, it's clean, uh, it's convenient, and it's fairly well thought out. Um, but sometimes public transit trips can take a long time, even compared to car trips in Singapore. And when we talk about the fraction of users that use um, transit services on a daily basis, in the Seattle area, for example, our regional transit agency, Sound Transit, is projecting that in 2040, uh, once their $150 billion light rail system has been constructed, that they will serve uh, overall transit will serve less than 5% of daily trips. And so UAM isn't necessarily about capturing a huge market share. It's about providing people with an option that they can use um, that helps them accomplish the goals in their business and their personal life. Um, sometimes it'll be recreation, it'll be just for fun. Uh, and other times it'll be a critical link um, say for healthcare providers um, and even for first responders. If we look at the Seattle area, I think we see that the most difficult journey to make um, in the past, and it will be again soon, is between downtown Bellevue and downtown Seattle. Um, light rail will serve that market in a few years, um, but UAM can help us unlock the potential of moving people and goods um, between areas that are not well served by um, a decongested freeway system, for example. And so Overall, travel trends, UAM isn't going to solve the traffic crisis, but it's going to provide individual users with opportunity that they don't currently have, and that's what's important. Great. Yolaka, I see. You, would you like to weigh in? I also have a uh, comparative transportation land use question, and uh, kind of a double question that I want to come back along this line of, of uh, discussion. 
But go ahead, Yolanda. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I agree uh, completely with what Scott uh, just said. Um, and I'd like to uh, add on to that. Um, another way that we look at uh, uh, possible uses for urban air mobility um, is in uh, transportation demand management. So um, especially uh, now in this time that so many people are working from home, it will be interesting to see, uh, we've already seen this with Facebook announcing that some of their workers will move to a permanent work from home uh, basis. Um, I think we will see an increase in flex schedule and, um, and teleworking. So if you think about uh, the worker that who previously spent 10 hours a week uh, commuting by single occupancy vehicle to their company's office, who might now um, instead work from home three or four days a week and take an urban air mobility vehicle into, into work one or two days a week and aggregate their meetings and in-person time. Um, I think that what you'll end up with is at least a wash on cost and a huge gain in terms of productivity and quality of life. I think the other thing that urban air mobility does in, when you think about an employer's transportation demand management uh, benefit package is that, uh, you know, one of the challenges for people whose employers give them uh, bus passes or light rail passes, uh, ORCA passes in the, uh, here in the uh, Pacific Northwest, is the, is the concern that what if I get a call at one o'clock and my child is sick? Um, and so having the, op the, the benefit from an employer to have a dozen UAM or two dozen UAM flights a year to make a quick trip back home will take off of their shoulders that concern uh, about being you know, stuck at work without a car. So uh, those are a couple of other examples. Um, I, I agree with Scott, urban air mobility is not going to resolve, uh, resolve congestion at all, but it, but it has other ways to um, augment and uh, a, a metropolitan transportation system. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got two or three questions about the impact on the Pacific Northwest and the Cascadia Corridor. But before I go on that, I've had a, a couple questions, one for Rick about uh, the technology and uh, specifically Rick, what are the game changers now for the U in the UAM world? And then we'll come back to the uh, impact on local transportation. There, there are several things that are going to or could possibly make a huge change in UAM. First is the idea of sustainable and regenerative power. So right now the battery storage and battery charging is kind of a limiting feature for the distance and power of UAM. But uh, drones are now using hydrogen power. Hmm. It's already a game changer for unmanned aircraft systems for small aircraft. And then ultimately solar and other types of energy systems will be a huge game changer. Another one is innovative materials. If uh, we can convert more and more aircraft with composite materials, ultralight metals, for example, magnesium based and things like carbon fiber, new polymers and continually reducing the weight of the aircraft, that will be a game changer. And the last thing is the, the more intriguing one for a lot of reasons is uh, artificial intelligence if the aircraft can be becoming more and more intelligent, improving their flight characteristics and so on. I briefly introduced Sarah, the Sikorsky, but that program can be adapted to any aircraft. So you can convert a Cessna or a Boeing 747 into a, an unmanned aircraft. So uh, machine learning, and then uh, there's another question related to UTM, unmanned aircraft systems. Can you explain UTM? That's a game changer for this to convert to that to universal traffic management. And the last one, which is a fun one, is uh, speech synthesis and speech recognition. So that alias program from DARPA is working on having uh, automated uh, autonomous systems that actually speak between the passengers, ground control, and, uh, and uh, other, other drones through using voice. So there's some wild things. And all these are in the process of uh, being developed right now. Well, you know, that's a good point. Uh, one of the things we uh, have been pursuing at the ACES Northwest Network is testing autonomous vehicles at the surface levels. 
And of course, companies like Waymo and GM Cruise and Argo and others are doing that, mostly in California and Arizona. Uh, PACCAR is doing some testing of platoon trucks and possible autonomous trucks on I-5. But we haven't been a test bed for autonomous vehicles yet. Some of it has to do with our weather um, and geographic patterns. But of course, in the surface, the challenge, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned artificial intelligence and machine learning, is for the vehicle that's operating in a congested urban area or by, with bicyclists or pedestrians, it's very difficult to learn the type of behavior that won't result in an accident. We are making great strides in that, but obviously if you talk about the open skies, that's a completely different test bed. And I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, to to come I, back to that other question as well, I'd like to reint reintroduce the idea that uh, we talk a lot about passengers for UAM, but the first uses for UAM are likely to be cargo. And as uh, Yolanka and Scott mentioned, emergency services. So uh, our company right now is developing a vertiport here in Oregon, primarily for emergency logistics. And I think we're going to see more of that before, long before you start seeing uh, urban taxis picking people up on street corners. Yeah, good point. I think you've addressed Bill Inman's question that came in. Uh, from Matthias and, uh, and J.R. Hammond are roughly related questions. Uh, the presentation's been high level. I wonder what specific plans are being developed for the Pacific Northwest region. And then J.R. Hammond, who uh, has been a real leader up in Vancouver in developing a UAM program, uh, uh, has typed in, uh, how does the narrative of advanced air mobility support, clash, or not affect the development of a stronger connection um, for, the high, for the Cascadia quarter, i.e. compare high-speed rail versus um, advanced air mobility. Does anybody want to take that question on, those questions on? Well, I'll start off then. Um, we, we already have urban air mobility in uh, the Pacific uh, Cascadia area. I mentioned Oregon helicopters. If uh, I have no connection with that organization or company, but they have point-to-point -point service now. So if you have a helipad site or an open site, they'll they'll pick you up and demand on demand mobility now. But for the corridor, um, UAM currently doesn't have the capacity, the capabilities of doing long range uh, transport. So it, it, that's not really within the battery uh, and power storage and designs of UAM aircraft yet. But there is an organization that Yolanka is a member of and Scott's a member of, and they can describe in more detail, that's developing a, a program for the Cascadia corridor. Uh, Yolanka, Scott? Uh, I, can, I can jump in first. Um, so um, a, a couple of different things uh, uh, with respect to that Cascadia corridor. Um, UAM and high-speed rail are two very different forms of transportation. Um, I think what, you know, high-speed rail um, clearly moves a lot of people, but on a fixed fixed point-to-point -point route. Uh, that's the whole point of high-speed rail. Um, so, uh, uh, con uh, advice, uh, uh, but on the other hand, urban air mobility is very flexible. Um, yes, you need, you need your landing spots, but how you travel between those landing spots can can, uh, can change all the time, depending on weather, on what, whatever factors there are. So um, I, I, I don't think that one obviates the other, but I think, I think that they serve very different functions. I think what also is true, um, and a, as Rick was just alluding to, there, there's some low hanging fruit here. And, and I would say that within the, our Cascadia or Pacific Northwest region, we um, not only do we ha we have Oregon helicopters, and I know Robert Walker down there as well, but uh, we have Kenmore Air. We have Harbor Air in, Va in Vancouver that flew an electric uh, uh, Beaver uh, several months ago. Um, so 
these uh, and and HeliJet. So we have um, we already have operators doing this work. Uh, they're not flying electric aircraft, but another um, early model here is the electric fixed wing. And somebody else mentioned the uh, demonstration next Thursday that MagniX is doing out at Moses Lake. MagniX is a Redmond company developing electric motors. It was their motor that flew in the Harbor Air aircraft, and they have installed that in a caravan, uh, Cessna caravan, uh, that they will fly on Thursday. Um, when you look at the number of regional, of smaller airports, in, the, in this country, we have 5,000 public airports, and we only use a tenth of those. There are small airports everywhere. So if we start simple, simply with small existing airports and look at con converting fixed wing aircraft from piston or fuel powered to electric motors, uh, we can recreate the regional network of the past that died as fuel costs went up. So this country's moved to a strong hub and spoke model and abandoned those smaller airports and consequently the communities that used them. And uh, so, so you can envision a number of uh, regional flights connecting those smaller cities um, that when powered with electricity once again become affordable. And I think that's a place to start. I agree, urban, you know, urban air taxis, uh, creating a system that works is years out uh, because of the technology, the uh, regulation, and also the, the infrastructure and planning. But, but, uh, but that regional fixed wing system uh, is, is a much lower hanging fruit. And again, cargo is an important uh, piece of that. Great. Um, last answer on this, and then I, I want to get a question to Spencer. You got to unmute. Unmute, Scott. Sorry. See, Lanka is uh, right on track um, when it comes to kind of the, the issues of mobility in rural areas. So if you take a state like South Dakota, for example, uh, the highway system is a grid and serves the needs for freight and transport. Um, but a lot of people actually do use uh, small airplanes to get between some of the cities because they can fly direct at an angle versus driving 100 miles to the north and 150 miles to the west. And so that's where the development of um, advanced air mobility, such as the uh, electrically operated e-caravan, is really important. Um, because then essentially anyone can install solar panels at an airport on a hangar and uh, store the electricity needed to charge the batteries in that airplane, for example. So it's, it's a really promising technology. Um, but getting back to you know, the, the contrast between high-speed rail in our region, um, the expense of high-speed rail associated with the realignment of uh, trackage, for example, um, is actually not, uh, it's, it, the cost far outweighs the benefit of the slightly shortened travel time for some of these distances. And so, but that's an entirely different conversation that isn't related to this. But one of the issues that we haven't addressed um, in depth in this webinar is the issue of freight mobility in urban areas. And so, for example, we're starting to see um, that Amazon is saying, well, it, by July or August, we might be able to start returning to maybe in September when they have their um, new Amazon Prime Day uh, that's been rescheduled, they might start to return to more distant time deliveries, but they're really struggling to deal uh, with this network um, for deliveries and that's in an environment when we don't have a lot of traffic congestion that is regularly recurring like we did um, back in February. And so um, one of the growth opportunities for UAM really in the interim and in the immediate term is uh, air mobility and it's something that Amazon's already explored. They've successfully delivered packages using autonomous drones. UPS is doing the same thing and we think that the urban freight delivery for advanced air mobility is likely to be uh, the beachhead that um, brings acceptance and broad acceptance of this technology because it means that we can eliminate traffic from our roads. Uh, we can eliminate some of the demand in the marketplace um, for drivers. Some people very much enjoy the package delivery work, but um, for others, it's simply a job. And so one of the beauties of automation is that it eliminates tasks that are dangerous and repetitive for humans. And so that's what we're looking forward to here. Yeah, and I'll add one thing. I don't know if Tim Turber from the Port of Seattle is on the call, but um, he's done a remarkable job in getting an urban air mobility forum together and looked at 
that using the parking garage at SeaTac Airport uh, for, uh, and, and also the apron around, uh, uh, I guess, the North Terminal. Uh, I, I think I, he told me that uh, FedEx or one of the companies was going to use a, a test electric uh, caravan flight to Port Angeles for um, freight delivery uh, using, um, frankly, their relatively low rates for uh, electricity. SeaTac has its, is its own utility and I think it charges four cents a kilowatt hour. So you could see a transition for both regional air, airports, as Yolanka indicated, and, and freight deliveries in the Northwest region um, using SeaTac and, and, and reducing the cost to the carrier dramatically. If you're getting four cents a kilowatt hour, that makes it fairly cost effective to deliver that freight. And I think it was the Redmond company, I think it's powering that caravan. Um, so we've got an example right here at SeaTac Airport that uh, is applicable. Uh, okay, circling back to Spencer, uh, and I don't know, Spencer, if you've answered this in the chat, chat line, but Carol's um, question is, with the diversity of industries and approaches to serve their customers and with services to create integration in the NAS, and I think you'll design, uh, tell us what that is, what are the plans to make operational common communication and computer interfaces between service centers and how much work has been done to plan these issues with the FAA manned flight NAS? Yeah, so let, let's first uh, define what the NAS is, uh, the NAS is the National Airspace. And so it's the term we, we use to loosely define the, uh, not just the, the airspace itself, but also the infrastructure that supports it. And so the question here is, is a great one since it's asking, how are we gonna get all these different systems, these different operators, and how, how is everyone gonna communicate in a pretty much a common language? And so, one of the kind of key things that we did that's kind of a spiritual predecessor to UAM is uh, UTM, which is the Unmanned Aerial Systems Traffic Management Project. It's a mouthful, but the real way to kind of think of it is, is small UAS. And so the kind of effort of UTM and what we're trying to move forward with, with UAM is establishing not just a common uh, activities that one would do with common operations, but also common interfaces for how these different systems communicate. And so what we did in UTM during our uh, different kind of tests of that system and that project was we created an API, an application program interface, which is basically a way for these different systems to communicate that was common to them. And so if you were an operator, you would have something called a USS, which is a uh, UAS service supplier, which is a bunch of different acronyms, but more or less what it kind of boils down to is if I'm an operator and I wanna submit a flight plan, how do I do that? And it defines the different uh, messages to communicate that. What you can do if let's say you're in an off nominal operation where maybe you lost communication with this vehicle. Maybe you have a vehicle that's not responding or is having technical difficulties with one of its uh, motors. And so all the nominal operation communication of, hey, I'm flying, I'm in this area, to, hey, something's going wrong, I need to talk to someone, are all predefined. And so transitioning that now to talking about UAM, at NASA, what we've kind of done is approach UAM in a very similar standpoint. And so something you might see if you look up urban air mobility is talking about things like volumes, which is what volume of airspace am I going to operate in, both spatially and temporally. So how long am I going to be in this area and where am I going? And so we've created this system that we are currently testing as part of this national campaign to figure out how these different operators can communicate between their vehicles. And then from the operator themselves, how do they communicate with other operators? So let's say that if I want to reserve this part of the airspace as a volume for my flight from, let's say, uh, Bellevue to Seattle, I'm going to go on this route for this amount of time. All, all of that communication 
and all that information is already predefined. And so all you have to do is submit that via a computer system to another operator that might be in that area, and then they're aware of it. And so it really provides a foundational common language and then the mechanisms that are used in these software systems to communicate that with everyone. And then for things like the FAA, it's similarly done so that let's say the FAA needs to put up a temporary flight restriction due to maybe a wildfire, they can communicate that to all the other operators and say, hey, get out of this area. If you need to reroute out of your volume and into controlled airspace, shoot us a message or we'll contact you and help you figure out how to get into that controlled airspace and operate safely. Great. Uh, I've got about nine, ten minutes, and I've got three quick questions. So I asked my uh, panelists to be, be quick. Uh, from Bill, I'm going to send this to you, Rick. How does weather, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, affect development of UAM? For those of us who fly around here, IMC and IC, even at low altitudes, is harsh reality year-round. Even if the autonomous vehicles can handle it, it could be terrifying for a passenger. Rick, you want to take that on? You need to unmute. I, I was laughing. Uh, you know, I think pa many passengers are going to be terrified even to begin with because getting inside a small cabin without a pilot is, as Yolanka said, going to be the first challenge. So if, if they're willing to take that risk, I think weather issues won't be as pressing. But Indeed, we have uh, some severe climate conditions. First of all, UAM operations will be restricted to ideal weather. It'll be fair, a fair weather service for passengers from the very beginning. Probably unable to fly in high winds, icing conditions and so on will simply ground UAM flights. And since they're primarily an optional choice for initial passengers, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. So it's, it's really gonna be a fair weather service for quite quite some time. Uh, the UAN industry is going to be highly, I'm not looking for the right word, concerned about the perception of safety for, for passengers. So if you, if you notice Yolanka's slide on the number of people that die every year in automobile accidents, it's absolutely horrific. But people will see risk very, very differently. And there'll be another game changer in this industry. The first time a passenger dies through either a collision or some other accident may shift public acceptance of this entire program, even though that's inevitable. I mean, I'm sorry to, to bring that up, but it's inevitable. It's like when the, automobile, when the automobile was invented, there were only two automobiles in the entire state of Ohio, but they collided with each other at an intersection. So they're despite all the safety precautions and all the redundancies for, for safety issues, there will be risk involved uh, at some point. So weather issues will be at a, at a high priority and flights will simply be grounded. Um, same thing with other aircraft. It's that the pilot will accept the risk, but the passengers won't be willing to accept those risks. Okay, I wanna get through these questions. Yeah, sorry. Uh, quick answer is how far have uh, advanced air mobility manufacturers gotten into certi certification of the proposed products? A quick answer to that. Does anybody know? Uh, the, uh, the one that's on the list uh, with a member of CAMI is Joby. Joby's going through their trials with uh, FAA to get certified for their Joby aircraft. The um, uh, WISC Cora aircraft is uh, attempting to get their trials but uh, it's going to be a challenge for the FAA to give approvals for these. Okay, then another technical question regarding UAM operation, who will be taking the actual flight role of EVTOL, which is electric vertical takeoff and landing? Existing part 135 helicopter operators like Helijet or airlines or rideshare company like Uber or another stakeholder, what do you think? Well, that's gonna be the big, the big challenge. As I mentioned, Oregon Helicopters is already positioned. It has commuter service to, from downtown Portland at the heliport to PDX and point to point. So they're already positioned to take on that role and convert from uh, piloted helicopters to unpiloted uh, UAM. But the capital that's being invested is huge for organizations like uh, companies like uh, Volocopter, Ehong, 
and others, and they were going to develop their, their separate system. So uh, it's a whole nother conversation, but I'm quite concerned that uh, urban planning and especially airport planning, uh, something important to me is, is being left behind in many ways by a, a, a fast effort from industries to develop voloports, e-ports, vertiports, and so on. Uh, the mode taken in Europe right now is to, for example, uh, purchase a car, a car parking structure and convert the top layer, layers into uh, voloports Volo or e-ports or whatever, and, and leaving airports somewhat behind. And as your other question was, the FAA is unfortunately very slow to respond to this. Um, airport forecasting uses aircraft models that don't even include UAM. So, the FAA has quite a bit of catching up to do. And if you'll notice, most of the programming is involved in testing in other countries, not the United States. Bruce, okay. can I uh, add a couple comments on this, yeah. on both of these? Um, so uh, with respect to um, the, act, the question about uh, actual flight, and um, I, under the current regulatory structure we have right now, um, yeah, it, it appears it will be most likely a Part 135 operator um, to 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 run the um, you know to be in charge of the app that connects these flights like like Uber uh, like an Uber app today is um, is not is not under the current regulatory structure. Um, actually being in charge of the flight, and it's very likely that that structure is going to be you know, it, it would be similar. It's going to require the FAA to certify the operators, whether the operator is, is a pilot in the plane or on the ground. So um, there's obviously work to be done there, but I think, I think that that's what we'll see. And it will uh, lead to some interesting, as, as these pieces start to meld together, and especially once you get autonomy involved, it's going to raise some interesting insurance questions for the, for the industry. I will also quickly say on the question of weather, this is, again, why it is so important that urban air mobility is integrated with the transportation system, because it doesn't take much to visualize that as people start to, to use urban air mobility, they're going to develop commuting patterns. And um, if that pattern includes a segment with a light rail and a segment on an urban air mobility vehicle, and on that day the weather is such that the UAM vehicles can't fly, that's going to have a big impact on the light on light rail. Vice versa, if you end up with a light rail train down, it's going to impact the usual flow of, of commuters through a vertiport. So um, it's really critical to understand how these different factors affect other modes in a multimodal system. Great. Okay, last question, then I'll let um, everyone take a crack at it. Uh, you can't have a forum these days without a COVID question. Uh, so I'll try to paraphrase it. With the catastrophic diversion of city, state, regional uh, revenues, we're seeing a, as a result of COVID-19, do you see a deferral of UA in planning and development, or could this pandemic ultimately accelerate UAM as a more efficient transportation more mode or as infrastructure projects designed to reduce unemployment while advancing our overall transportation system? Some interesting themes in that question. Uh, Scott, you wanna take a quick crack at it? And, and Spencer, you gotta unmute. Scott, you need to unmute. Okay, so uh, great question. And uh, I think that the answer to that question is really um, needs us to understand where this money is coming from to do these things. And so when we're looking at private sector investment, what we recognize is two things. Number one is we, we need the equity, we need the capital to purchase these facilities, to purchase the aircraft, to pay all the people who are uh, designing and building these systems and are going to be operating them. Uh, and private equity markets have changed uh, since March, but the damage I'm understanding is not as bad as many people thought that it was. And it's an opportunity for new companies with new approaches to come into this. Uh, um, it's not even a post-COVID world yet. It may never be. We don't know. Um, with technologies and transportation options that are appealing to people. So if the idea of getting into a vehicle where there are no other passengers or maybe only one operator um, 
is perhaps quite appealing to people. And so that may cause some advancements, but we're also seeing the trend of what's going to happen to urban centers like downtown Seattle, downtown Chicago, um, downtown Portland. Uh, are people still going to commute and go to an office? And so it's entirely possible that uh, real estate markets could change significantly in the next three to five years, which could lead to opportunities for UAM operators um, seeking to deploy these systems to find new places to put their facilities. So uh, the world is changing quickly, um, but the good news is that um, with the UAM investment, the government isn't making the investment. The government is merely providing the regulatory environment at this point, which is fairly clear, I think, for uh, these operators, although sometimes um, they challenge, they push the limits, that's what startups do. But we're also seeing that um, this investment, the risk is being borne by people who believe in the technology and recognize uh, the potential outcomes and know that there are solid business plans. And even if there are losses up front, uh, the ultimate payout, um, for example, for the employees who are also shareholders in a company, for example, um, could be quite lucrative. Good point. Spencer, you are nodding affirmatively. You want to add? Uh, yeah. Stuff? Scott, Scott had a, a lot of great points there. And, and something that not only Scott kind of mentioned, but Yolanka had mentioned as well was we're, we're potentially seeing a, a shift towards having much more remote uh, work. And what that might mean is that we might see more sprawl. And as their sprawl increases, people are going to want to commute less and spend less time in the long commute. And so that might, might, you know, might provide an opportunity for UAM to be even more attractive to someone. And just as, you know, technology disrupts any kind of disruption and the way that we go about our lives is going to provide some form of uh, shift in not only technology, but also how we use it. And so I, I would personally say at least that I believe that with COVID, we are learning a lot about what kind of work is being done to have people be able to work from home, but also how are we going to be more efficient about when we are in a uh, you know, very dense area? Can we have people travel around more safely and not have to travel as much if they don't need to? And so urban air mobility is on-demand mobility. Yeah, and it's a great point about Cascadia Corridor. You know, a lot of people live in, uh, work in Kent or Bellevue live in Lake Stevens or Mount Vernon. And so... Uh, urban air mobility could could provide an, an opportunity, particularly if you're not going into work every day. You know, um, I got to put a plug into Brian Mistley and Inrex, my co-chair at ACES. Uh, Inrex has done a study of long distance commuting opportunities in California, Midwest, and East Coast. So I'm going to try to get Brian and his team to take a look at the Cascadia Corridor because I think it is a great opportunity. And I know the Cascadia Innovation Corridor that Microsoft and uh, former Governor Gregoire have been leading, uh, are looking at transportation options in, in the, along the corridor and in, in servicing those mid-sized cities that need economic development, spreading some of that wealth out from the kind of Bellevue, Kirkland, Redmond Innovation Triangle to more uh, mid-sized cities along the corridor. So I think that's our time. Uh, I guess I'll turn it back to Lord. And what I'm excited to announce is our next webinar. It's Friday, June 26th. And what we're doing is doing it the fourth Friday of every month is what our goal is. The next follow on, it's really continuing the future of mobility with Don Damish, Senior Director of New Business Ventures at Boeing. He's quite well known. He's, he was at Insitsu, now at Boeing. This should be a really interesting session as well. What he's responsible for is collaboration with third parties to advance Boeing's future mobility initiatives. So that's including the oversight of the SkyGrid joint venture that is developing a software platform for the safe integration of unmanned and autonomous vehicles in the global airspace. This should be an exciting uh, webinar. And again, look for our email about registering for that. I'd like to thank our platinum and gold sponsors. Uh, these people are who allow us to operate and contribute to uh, our mission and the STEM grants that we provide. So, and I'd like to shout out to all of our sponsors there. And it's Hood Technology and Northwest UAV is platinum and our gold is EP, b and Insurance, Aerospace News Magazine, Perkins Coey, Near Station and Tillamook Test Range. Thanks again, everybody. A really big thank you, Bruce and Lori. Bruce, you did a great job in the session taking a very complex 
set of questions and managing this. Thank you, Lori. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. Thank you very much.